successiva, eh, il termine di tecnica è stato comune della possibilità di scattare di un, se non fatto del tempo di futuro. E quindi il primo passo è il mare di sistemi del parco, il primo passo è il primo passo, 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 il primo passo è il
20 years ago, some had recently attended. If I recall my going to the economics class first time and listening to my professor, so what he uh, told me that there is some place called a market. And this market is very efficient. It determines, based on demand and supply, the prices of commodities, the services, and everything. And it's so cool that if there is any inequality, if there is any imbalance, it will adjust it automatically. So knowing that, that I'm going into a field which has this automatic balancing, which has this uh, impact on society that doesn't allow the unfairness was a great experience for me. But as I move along, and you all have moved along, then we found that, oh, oh the simplest way of putting economics in was good, but then there are issues whenever the economy will face, we need somebody to monitor it. We need somebody to regulate it. We need somebody to bring it back and then the role of financial uh, regulators and central banks, the role of the Ministry of Finance, the Monetary Authority, and all those roles they play. And then the comfort was that there is a way to deal with that as well. So the government can introduce the policy interventions, and based on policy interventions, we can adjust, we can go back to the mean, we can go back to the balance. So, with this backdrop in mind, I'll, I'll take you back to your first few economics classes. So, I want you to be with me to see how uh, the whole concept of finance has to be. And in, in this journey, I would request you to not assume that I am against finance or economics. I believe, uh, I very strongly believe in the presence of finance and presence of the economics, the discipline of economics. So, so far, I, I, I intentionally put the titles as Econ 101. I'm more probably you all have this Econ 101 when you were in the university. So what we have learned in Econ 101 that the financial institution has the main role of accepting deposit and lending it to the people who need it. So there are small savers who save money, and then this money would be given by given to a financial institution say for example a bank, and this bank has the ability to evaluate and monitor businesses and give them money, and in the process they earn some income, let's call this income as the intermediation income. So they pay a little bit of money to the depositor, they charge higher interest or higher fee from the, from, 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 from the borrower, and then make some money out of it. So what is the impact of that? So it makes capital available for real economic activity. So if I'm starting a new business, I need money, I'll go to the bank, the bank will look, will assess my uh, uh, credit worthiness, will assess my ability to generate some revenue, and then based on that will give money, and then I will go into the market, I, I start to, I, I'll do my business, I hire people, that will result in a good industrial development. Okay? And we have seen that industrial development early 1900, uh, mid, uh, mid, uh, mid 20th century, so, the main benefit is, for, for doing this intermediation, we basically have leaped forward in that. We have made more funds available. We made the capital allocation more efficient at that time. That means that we were able to find job, more jobs for individuals. We were able to bring a, bitter, uh, a much bigger middle class that was not existent uh, in the early 1900s. I'll take you to the other uh, Econ 101 concept, the role of capital market. And we believe that, and the, 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 this, is, this is what uh, the main, uh, main, main function of the capital market is, that it allows the efficient capital allocation. So that means uh, it would be difficult for me to go, and find, to go and find somebody who is in need of funds and who can get generate some return for me. So now, <laughs> keeping that in mind, the capital markets help us to do that, we don't have to go and find the marketplace where it will help us to get that. So, what happened is, so now rather than going only with the financial institutions like a bank, we can, companies can generate directly capital through stocks and bonds. 
And all these stocks and bonds to begin with had claim on real assets. So remember this part. So the benefits to investors, shareholders, the number one benefit, you are directly linked with the real company. You, are, you, are, you, don't, you know where you have your investment is. The income of the company will turn into your income. If the value of the company increase, it will be part of your value increase. So you will gain income plus the capital gain by investing directly into the capital market. If you do that, so again, the benefit of more jobs, more people will be employed. The real sector will grow further. So that means more income for people, higher middle class. I'll take you another concept of inflation. So I'm going through very quickly a few concepts. I'll try to get through uh, most of the econ one one So for the concept of inflation, we know that it's very simple. There is more money in the market. There is more money to chase for fewer assets. So if we have fewer assets and more money is there, what's going to happen? Higher prices. So if, if, if we have more oranges and less money, price of the orange will go up. But if we have more money, and less oranges, the price of orange will go up. So, the question uh, arises whether it is good for economy or not. Did somebody say something? Okay, I'm sorry. So, is it is it good for economy or not? So, I'm, I'm not going to go and, and raise the discussions here, but in, in very simple terms, sorry, uh, in, in very simple terms, if it is controlled, if it is managed, if we know what we are doing, if we expect what inflation is, it is good for the economy. If you, we, all, we all know that the central bank now set targets for inflation. New Zealand was the first example where they have said that they need at least 2% inflation every year to keep the economy growing. But if it is not expected, it is unexpected, the inflation increase the way it happened in Turkey last uh, December, January the way it is happening in Pakistan these days. That the price of the good you went yesterday was one dollar in the local currency and the next day it is five dollars. So how could you bear with all that? Venezuela is another case. So if the inflation is going so high, so is there a, is there a possible, is there any possible policy intervention? We all know that. That's what we're starting our economic on 101. Inflation is going up, then what you need to do? Increase the interest rate. Increase the interest rate. Reduce the tax incentives. If you do that, the more money which is in the, in the, in the economy will be extracted and the prices will go down. Okay? But what happens sometimes is, when you try to do hard work of balancing this thing, Sometimes it goes harder than what we expect, and the economy might go into recession. So, now if the economy goes into recession, now we have to inverse the relationship. So, when inflation was very high, we increase the interest rate. Now, the economy is in recession, we reduce the cost of funding. That means we encourage people to borrow money and do more business. The government reduce taxes so that more people, more money is available to individuals, more money is available to entrepreneurs to invest and, make, uh, and create more jobs. And they increase infrastructure spending as well to create more jobs. So what it does, it creates jobs, it enhances entrepreneurship. So all these policy interventions that I have mentioned here is to balance the economy. If the economy is going down, we go one way. If the economy is going up, if the inflation is going up, we go the other way. And these things, in our economics class, work very well. Okay. So, what happened in the past few years, in the past few decades, I would say, the financial market is growing fast. And if you see, uh, the growth has some blood with it. And I, I looked at the definition of the growth at uh, this uh, Cambridge English Dictionary. So, one growth is the one that we all desire for. We want a good growth, that means the company was earning 2% yesterday, today it's earning 3%, 4%, 5%, it's going up uh, with every quarter and every, uh, with, with the good period of time that we're looking at. But there's another growth, which is undesirable. 
So it's purely determinant. It's undesirable. It's a kind of a lump that can be created in, say, for example, in, in body of a patient that can lead to cancer. So I'm putting those both both views in my mind when I was writing this uh, uh, this growth part. And the the way I, I, I see it that the economy, the, the financial markets has grown well. And what we see that there are new classes of financial assets. So initially in Econ 101, I learned that there are bank deposits, I learned there were stocks, there were bonds, and now what we see there are more classes of assets. And what are those? So what we have seen is the securitization back in the late 80s. So the securitization, it's financial assets. So the main aim behind the securitization is you are creating financial assets from financial assets. So I refer you back in case of bonds and in case of stocks, those are financial assets based on real assets. A company is behind it. What well, securitization, you have financial assets created from financial assets. So you have created a mortgage. To let for, for a house, and then from that mortgage loan, you have created the securitized uh, assets. Then we got, we, 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 we get one notch up. So we started collateralization. So collateralization is you have the financial assets behind the financial asset. At some point, you don't need that financial asset. So you, you mix things that you do not have even financial assets behind the financial asset that you're creating now. And the last, uh, the, the, the last uh, asset that we have created, the new, new, new class of financial assets, is the derivatives. And this, these, these derivatives, in a lot of the cases, are used for trading purposes. Like, I was looking at some data just last week. And to my surprise, the top eight banks in the U.S. controls about 90% of the derivatives market. And of their portfolio, about 95% is for trading purposes. So we are kind of in zero sum game there. Second thing that we have observed over the year is the secondary market trading volumes. So the secondary market trading volumes increase in value, increase to an extent uh, that no human is controlling it. It's algorithm who are controlling the, 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 the trading of these assets. So that means they are looking for an opportunity, an arbitrage opportunity. The moment they see it, they trade it without any real fundamental reason behind it. So it's just in the market, they assume that there is a nominal in the market, and based on that, they start trading the assets. So now, human is not trading against the human. We do not have any value or the fundamental assessment of the company that we are trading in, it's only the system trading against the system. And we, we do have observed that there are companies whose, uh, whose, 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 whose values increase without even with their deteriorating fundamentals. And the last but not the least item that has increased this concept uh, the, the, this negatively or adversely affecting the growth is the passive investments. Uh, I'm a culprit of teaching my students that passive investment is the best investment because you don't have to do any analysis. You don't have to uh, look at even the fundamentals of anything. What you need to do is you need to assume that the market is intelligent enough and there are people who are actively analyzing the companies and based on that they will adjust the price of the market and you just take the price of the market and if you take the price of the market you'll be good well this is what we are teaching most of the finance teachers that who are here who are teaching investments this is what we are teaching well what we are seeing in the past eight ten years that passive investment is causing another issue in the market since everybody believes that passive investment is the best investment, there are nobody to evaluate the companies now. <coughs> so algorithms are working against the algorithms. No active uh, analysis of the companies, of their fundamentals. So life is very easy. 
Since we are moving towards the passive investment, so we have large, very large institutional investors. Trillions of dollars are held with Black Rock, with Templeton Prime. So all these big names, they are hoarding all the cash and all the assets. So what it does? The whole thing results in our focus on very short term return. We are not concerned with the real economic growth as investors. We are not concerned with the impact of a company that has on the society. We are not concerned the impact of a company's practices on the human rights. We are not concerned with the practices of a company against working against the laborers. We are not concerned with anything. The only thing we are concerned is that I have invested hundred dollar day before yesterday, or even these days the tick traders or the, 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 the day traders, and in the evening I had one hundred and two dollars, and this two dollar is good enough for me to compensate for taking the risk for one day. So imagine how could a company earn two percent return on every day basis? So it's all uh, I don't want to use the word fake, but it's not real uh, return, and with all the all the negative effect. So what it does, so this growth in financial uh, sector has burdened the real economy. So what we see, uh, so this, is a, this is a paper from Pepin, uh, 2015, which says the cost of financial, financial intermediation unchanged for ages. For, for the past 130 years, the cost of financial intermediation, like the cost, the bank has borrowed money, Sorry, the, 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 the amount, that the, the, the difference between the amount at which, which depends the, the margin from the bank. So this margin is not changing, it stays between 1.7 to 2%. Like we know for a lot of the other industries, because of the industrialization, because of the technological advancements and so on and so forth, this number has changed a lot. There is a lot of innovation within the banking and finance sector. But unfortunately, most of the finance, most of the uh, innovation is a kind of rent seeking. So the return for the banks is not declining. Like if I look at the monopoly power of financial sector in the U.S. now, so it contributes nine percent to the GDP. <coughs> Even it's not double digit. It contributes four percent to the jobs. Well, it takes away twenty five percent of the return. So if it is taking 25% of the corporate profits, so who would be willing to invest in real sector when you have high returns within the banking sector? And what this whole thing has done to us, that it has inflated the values of our financial assets. Since we are not interested in creating new assets, the assets that are in the market, due to passive investments, due to technological advancement, due to free money available in the economy, all the values of financial assets has increased to a very high level. So imagine that 2008-2009 crisis, uh, S&P 500, the value at which it was, it has increased four times the value of that. Has the real economy increased four times the value by during this time? That, that's the question that we should ask ourselves. So, the title of my presentation was The Elephant. And we see a lot of blood and growth in all the places. So we are looking for some blood here and there. So where is that elephant? So what is that elephant is? So we know that things are happening in the economy. <coughs> we know that my Econ 101 is not helping me now. Because the government has reduced the interest rate to almost to zero level. It did not increase the financing to the business sector. The government has reduced the taxes to as low as possible. Major benefit of the tax reduction has gone to the big corporations. It didn't go to uh, the, the, the small uh, Joe Blow shopkeeper. So to me, the elephant in the economy that we have now is the financialization. 
is the increasing role of financial motives, financial markets, financial actors, and financial institutions in the operation of domestic and international countries. So when I'm giving you the examples here of the US, it doesn't mean that the situation is better in other places. It's a similar situation. But I give you a very close example, as since I'm from Pakistan. So in Pakistan, the interest rates were pretty low, 6% with the inflation rate of around the same number. And in the last three months, they have raised the interest rates from 6% to about 10.75%, so about 4%. And the value of the market is down by 25%. So imagine the main stock index down by 25% by increase of 4% interest rate because most of the investment in the capital market was from the money borrowed from the financial institutions. <coughs> the financial institutions, they, they cannot pay back it. The margin pause and all those things are happening and that result in decline of the market. Has the real economy down by 25%? No. So we have to think it more carefully. Are we really looking at when we are reporting the, the, the capital market numbers? Are they really the numbers that we should look at? They have no linkage with the real economy. This is simply inflation of financial assets. And what it does? But if, it, if it was happening only within the uh, financial markets, a few investors are dealing with each other, they are losing each other's money, I have no issue with that. The gamblers in casinos, if they are doing something, it is their business. If they are willing to take the risk and do, the, do all those stuff, I have no problem with that. But the problem is, the way we are doing in financial markets now, it has its social costs. What we have seen is the politics of capitalism now. What we see that the government, when they are announcing anything related to the economy, whether be it is reduction in the interest rate or increase in interest rate, whether be it is the capital spending, whether be it is even the taxes. But we have seen in the past three years what has happened in the US. Everything has evolved around to benefit the big corporations. Unfortunately, most in the financial sector. So that what, what it does? It is creating now higher income disparity. So the one percent, the top one percent is holding eighty percent of the assets. So the ninety-nine percent or the ninety-five percent, if I be a bit more conservative. So 95% of the global population has only 1% of the or 2% of the financial of the wealth. So it is causing huge income disparity. On top of that, our major focus is now, what is my financial return the next second? We have tick traders. So day trader is now, a day is much longer time for investment. So with this short, short termism, do we expect something to happen? No. We would not have any funds for long-term investments. Who would bother to invest in a company, build an industry, put a plant there, start production, and takes five to eight to ten years to start getting benefit out of it? Well, somebody sitting next to him on the next desk can do that starting tomorrow. Okay? So there will be no investment for real sector and social sector. Uh, if, if I'm recalling properly, we have done a report recently on the uh, financing for long-term investment at the Islamic Development Bank. And we tried to find out where there is some funds available for long-term investments. So if you need, say for example, six trillion dollars for the next three, four years for the long-term investment to put money in, the money is available in the market. But where this money is? either sitting in the form of cash, in money market instruments, or in some of those, the, the instruments that I have mentioned. So they are not willing to put money for long term because they believe that they can earn higher return here. And this mentality takes us into the boom and bust cycle. We see on daily basis now, like the 600 points up and 1500 points down. We all are into the points in, in, in this point game. So now the system thrives, basically, even increasingly, on debt and very good profits. So I just mentioned that to you. So,
How can we move forward? So should we go back to Ori Khan 101? Yes, we have to do that. We have to think back. What has been wrong with us? The economy has leveraged to an extent. Uh, I was reading a paper yesterday in Canada, the household leverage has increased to enormous level. For doing what? Most probably it's not the mortgage. A lot of it is student loan, a lot of it is uh, car loans, a lot of it is personal consumption for travel and so on and so forth. So, overall for the economy, we have to think of deleveraging the economy. We have to link the financial sector with the real sector. We have to increase more equity-based financing than the debt-based financing. We have to reduce somehow speculation in the economy. We have to discourage, we have to regulate the speculation. The long-term investment returns, we would like the investors to think more clearly to be linked with the real economy. We have to think more ethically. We have to think for the compassion. We all have to do all these things to go uh, into details. I know that a lot of you has uh, the, the presentations coming in, so I'm not going to go too much into detail. Uh, but I will put my last two points very quickly, and I would say that uh, it's not all lost. Finance is still relevant. Economics is absolutely relevant. We have to deal with the growth. If you recall the second meaning of growth, the law, that we have to deal with. So, we need to increase, we need to bring in more financial assets. We need to make availability of financial assets more accessible. So I would say that we have to get out of these investment banker kind of mentality. We have to privatize the financing. Make it easy for people to go and get financing. The platforms, the blockchain, and all these things are there. And we hope that it will be the future. We need to democratize the access to financial services. We want everybody to have access to the financial services. Through a bank, it may not be possible. We need to find some very cost-effective solutions uh, for that. I'm sure in the uh, next two, three days, you all will be discussing some of these points. We all are concerned. Uh, I know Dr. Nakata Sute uh, will be taking uh, the presentation from this point onward, where he will be talking more on the uh, financialization and the moral economy. And most inshallah, he will, he, will, he will enlighten you on the moral economy, the, the side of the, the impact of the moral economy on the financialization. So I'll leave you here. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.